118 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. <coughs> Actually, all board members are present. The State Board of Education meeting of June 12th, 2018 is called to order. The next item is public participation in State Board of Education meetings. And Marilyn, are there any individuals who wish to address the board this afternoon? There are. I have seven forms. And so um, the time limit will be three minutes. And I will tell you who is coming to the table and then who is next so that the second person can prepare. And I would like to remind you, if you don't already know, that the State Board of Education is happy to hear whatever it is you've come to tell them, but they do not engage in a conversation during this portion of the meeting. Somebody may contact you following the meeting, but that's the expectation. So Sharon White, you'll be first, and Sherry Wells will be second. And you can monitor the time right here. Sharon here? Well, Sherry, how would you like to be first? <laughs> Somebody have a form for me? I'll come get it. Thank you. Nope, oh, there she is. Got another one. Another one. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Sherry, whenever you're ready, we're ready. Okay, and my handouts are... Yep, as soon as I can get okay. things together okay. here, I will. <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> Sherry A. Wells, you've seen me before uh, running for the State Board of Education here for the Green Party. I continue to do my homework. I keep learning so much. I learn a lot at these meetings when I'm here, but also in between. Um, <clears throat> former Superintendent Mr. Whiston had expressed a concern about the Benton Harbor Schools and their <clears throat> partnership agreement. <clears throat> and I asked him if he was aware that one of their corporate partners, Whirlpool, is the one that took a public park and turned it into a private golf course. And he was not aware of that. But there are other things that I've been doing. I was in Benton Harbor for a rally. Uh, about the during the PGA event, the PGA, which is part of this golf course that took over public property <coughs> and got a million dollars in state funding, and yet their schools are under emergency management. Uh, Reverend Pinckney has been one of the community activists I've been in contact with. He's the person who served 30 months in prison for something that they didn't have enough evidence to prove that he had done, and our Michigan Supreme Court has exonerated him. And so the 30000 a year that they haul people in, they will now be compensating him. Uh, the good thing is when he was up there, he was doing some rehabilitative education of the people in there, tutoring them with math, and that was absolutely wonderful. But while I was there for that rally, this is one of the signs he let me take back with me. Whirlpool's partnership, that's in quotes, has too many strings, our kids need teachers, not puppet masters. Benton Harbor has a lot of problems, and I don't know what the partnership agreement, I sent him a list of who the partners were, and he pointed out Whirlpool and two others that are taking the money that does, belongs to the children. I'm comparing Benton Harbor and St. Joseph. I call this a tale of two cities. And you will see Benton Harbor is, um, 7% white, 89% black. St. Joseph across the bridge is 88% white, 5% black. The median income in Benton Harbor is the lowest in the state. 17,000 <coughs> per capita income is the lowest, and that's at 8,900. And you have these comparisons, and the only big comparison I see is race and the economics. So the wraparound has to start before they can do anything with any partnership agreement. So my demographics and my other compilation is coming around for you. Uh, it's, it's a start. I've got lots more homework to do. But I'm glad to share some of my findings with you, with eight minutes, seconds to spare. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Roberto Torres, followed by John Barnes. Mr. Tor are you Mr. Torres? Yes. Yes. The, the way I, I turned it in is uh, my cousin is also going to be following me. So 
Okay, so what's your cousin's name? Renee, Renee de la Cruz Banning. Okay, so we can have her follow you. You want to do it together, Marilyn? You can both sit at the table. Yes, yes. that's perfectly fine. Thank you. It's her first visit. It's my second visit. <laughs> We're ready when you are. Co-chairs and members of the board. My name is Roberto Torres, Executive Director of One Wyoming Inc., and co-founder of a Latino business investment group, Primos 96. First, allow me to congratulate one of your colleagues, um, Dr. Uh, Lupe Ramos Monteni, uh, as a recent recipient of the Spirit of Frida Political Award. Um, her award is well-deserved, and as a West Michigander, I'm very proud to call her a colleague. Several years ago, I addressed you on the issue of ESL and Spanish immersion. I called on more funding for our growing Latino student population in Grand Rapids Public Schools. Since that time, I have worked in uh, collaboration with the Granville Corridor Partners and the Habitat for Humanities to realize mm -hmm. a new dual immersion high school in the Southwest community of Grand Rapids. Today, I work with uh, multiple school districts in the city of Wyoming. We manage uh, a one-to-one -one, uh, mentoring program that provides over 300 students with mentors from our business community. <clears throat> Another example of our support on Wyoming schools is a, a partnership that will bring the women's soccer champion of Mexico, Tigres Femenil, to Godfrey Lee High School. You see, Godfrey Lee is a district where over 60% of the student population is Latino. We invite you to join us on Saturday, June the 30th for that event. And I also would uh, <laughs> invite uh, board member uh, Montedi to join us for the first kick on that day. That opens the ceremony up for, that, uh, for that, uh, that event. You see, when business and schools work together, our community wins. And in this case, we in the Latino community are working together with, with, uh, with our schools. I'm here today also to support uh, my prima, my cousin, Renee de la Cruz Benning on a matter of interest to students with certain dietary needs and nutritional needs. Her situation should bring attention to those needs of her daughter and those of other children in our state. Thank you. Hi, and thank you all for your time and your support and everything that you do for our schools in the great state of Michigan. Have you ever loved a school district so much that you are willing to drive your kids 30 miles each way to get them there? I'm literally talking 120 miles every single day. We did that not just for one year or even two years, but for five and a half years. We have been so committed to Williamson Community Schools since our now sophomore daughter attended Little Hornets Preschool Program. Next, we have watched our seventh grade daughter flourish as she started with Little Hornets on up into middle school. Lastly is our youngest daughter, Alyssa, who will be in kindergarten in the fall. Of course, we wanted to give her the same opportunities as her <coughs> sisters so that she too had the opportunity to have Little Hornets for two years. We were so thrilled and excited for the opportunities and experiences that those two years of preschool would have in store for her. After all, this was the same preschool that her sisters went through and still to this day have amazing memories of their time there. However, my youngest daughter did not have the same opportunities and experiences, and neither did we as her parents. Here's the thing. My daughter, who is now five years old, has severe anaphylaxis allergy to a natto. And unfortunately, it's not something that we have control over. We can't just fix her or make it go away. It's not that easy. Before her first day of her first year of preschool, I spoke at length with her teacher about her allergies. I went over in great detail how severe her allergy was and provided them with a detailed list of every snack on the menu that, that she could and could not have. I thought that we would have no issues. Sadly, this is not the case. In December 2017, when I picked Alyssa up from preschool and immediately noticed that she was covered in hives welt marks on her face, neck, and stomach, there were approximately 18 children in the classroom and four teachers, yet somehow nobody noticed she was having an allergic reaction. She was served alphabet cereal, which contains a natto. Thankfully, I was able to treat her in enough time to prevent me from rushing her to the emergency room. I reached out to the preschool director after the incident, and I was reassured that this would never happen again. I felt somewhat at ease. Fast forward to September 2018. I looked at the snack menu and noticed that there were several items that contained an auto in them. Rather than asking for the menu to be revised, I spoke to the head teacher one on one and asked her if they were going to be serving things with an auto in the classroom, if they could at least have the kids wash their hands afterward. Her response 
It's not like she's going to be licking the toys or anything. I did, in fact, tell her that she was correct. My daughter would not go around licking the toys. However, all kids, mine including, have disgusting habits. They put their hands in their mouths, nose, ears, and pretty much everywhere that they shouldn't. Therefore, if the kids ate an auto and touched the toys that my daughter did, and she did the same, she could be in grave danger. The second time this year, I spoke with a preschool director in her office, where Alyssa's teacher came in partway through. So, and so did the snack person. The, rec the director told both of them specifically there was to be no more Anato in the classroom. Okay, thank you. Um, that there was to be no more Anato allowed in the classroom. They both agreed to keep it out. When that didn't work, I sat down with our superintendent. He was very sympathetic to the situation. He reassured me that this would no longer be an issue and that he would take proper steps to ensure things like this would never happen again. I do believe, I did believe just that. I feel that he did with, deal with this properly by speaking with the director, the teacher, and the snack person directly. However, clearly this was not taken seriously either, or I wouldn't be reaching out to you now. During Alyssa's last week of school, she was so thrilled to hear that she was going to be able to have ice cream at her end of the year party. I mean, what kid wouldn't be? She asked her teacher if she got to have the ice cream and if there was no annatto in it, and she was reassured that she could have it, and there was, in fact, no annatto in the ice cream. Fast forward to the last day when I went into the classroom. I spoke with the head teacher and she said, we are all set for the party. I personally checked every label and Alyssa can have everything. I was excited for Alyssa. However, I was still a little apprehensive to trust the words because clearly this has been an issue in the past. So I asked if I could check it myself. I went and checked everything, but I couldn't find the ice cream. So I went to the kitchen and checked the two small freezers. Then I went back in the classroom and asked her teacher if she could lead me to where the tub of ice creams were. They were in the big freezer. I pulled out the tubs of ice cream after she handed them to me and I looked at it and it actually, I said, this actually does have a natto in it. She said it does. Now, she now said, I read on all the labels on everything but the ice cream. So which was it? Did she read the labels on everything, on everything but the ice cream or did she even bother to read labels at all? I just wondered how this was acceptable and I asked her how this could happen once again. There weren't peanuts in anything that was served in the classroom, yet there is no children in the classroom who have peanut allergies. They still weren't willing to protect the child who has an anaphylaxis allergy to something else. I asked them if they had any idea what could have happened to my five-year-old daughter who trusts her teachers wholeheartedly. What if I had not been there to read the label? I mean, what if I didn't work for such a wonderful company who allowed me to be there and I couldn't and I just trusted the words out of her teacher's mouth. I'll tell you what, rather, rather than my child being able to celebrate her last day of preschool on the playground and at the park with her friends, she would have spent time in the hospital if we were fortunate enough to, to have made it there. We love Williamston Community Schools and are aware that every school has things that they need to work on as a district. I just don't want to read or hear about any more close calls or losses of lives for something that is 100% preventable. Perhaps a reasonable resolution would be for schools, all schools in Michigan to be required to complete an extensive in-person, not online course, like in a classroom setting um, on allergy safety. Maybe treat each case as if it's its own. Maybe all families and schools with kids with allergies could have some sort of form or something that follows them along like an action plan. Um, I feel that if this happened, a lot of these things could be prevented as long as they take these things seriously. Although my daughter will no longer attend the Little Hornets preschool program, she will still remain in the district. I think that something needs to be done for all schools. If this could just help save one life, I'm satisfied with that. Thank you. <coughs> Our next speaker is John Barnes, and he will be followed by Amber Kases, K-A-S-I-Z. Kasich, you, are you going to be, oh, okay, you can do that. You can come together if you want. At the time. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, what, we'll, we'll start it whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm, John Barnes, and I am representing the Michigan Teacher Leader Advisory Council Working Group that is talking about teacher leadership networks. Uh, first of all, I want to say how much 
um, as a part of this inaugural uh, group, we enjoyed coming together. That was one of the things that was best about it was finding out that uh, some one of, many of us have uh, in our schools, you know, individually in our silos, when we come together, a lot of uh, common ground um, values and uh, interests. Uh, and one of the things that uh, in my group, we have eight um, that were interested in doing teacher leadership. And uh, we started our conversations in December. Um, and we started by going out and looking at some other states. We are uh, in the midst of uh, an initiative, top 10 in 10 years, and we were looking at um, Tennessee and Iowa and Massachusetts and some of the things that were going on in other uh, states for teacher leadership initiatives. And then um, in March, uh, there was the Governor's Summit and a Teach to Lead, Powered by Teach to Lead, um, uh, opportunity where we came together and actually saw some of you speak and that was great to be introduced to you uh, and we're able to flesh out some of our ideas into uh, some of the slides that uh, have been passed out here uh, through a, a, a template that they provided us uh, so moving forward my working group would love to uh, use some of the timelines and calls to action to enlist some of the school districts in um, appointing teacher leaders uh, for teacher retention, sort of a two-pronged approach where uh, at one point we can bring uh, mentor teachers into classrooms with struggling teachers uh, who maybe would be facing leaving the profession. We could provide remediation uh, lessons, team teaching, to tactically look at specific things that they are struggling with and hopefully bring them up to speed so that they could stay. Um, and also, we might be able to afford um, teachers with a lot of experience a way to a growth growth path for them. Uh, right now, the only growth path we're really offered in traditional uh, districts is uh, principalship and, and uh, sort of a very vertical alignment um, and we would love to see more horizontality, a, uh, a matrix approach where we had um, mentor teachers and, and other uh, teachers that could uh, as a growth path go from being in the classroom to helping other teachers be successful. Well, thank you all uh, for listening to us today. I also am a member of the Teacher Leadership Advisory Council, and my subcommittee focused on new teacher mentoring and induction. Uh, and like John on the Teacher Leadership Committee, we have done similar work um, on uh, for us really focusing on new teachers and mentorship. mentorship. And we have first reflected back on our, our own early teaching careers, and wow, Things have really changed, especially, I think, in the last six years, really, since 2011 and 12. And uh, this is my 14th year of teaching. I just finished my 14th year. And I have to say, if I were a new teacher today, I might be absolutely, utterly overwhelmed by the prospect of navigating the evaluation system and succeeding in my classroom. And, and we are charged with so very much. Uh, which we should be, and, and that, that is not a complaint. But we all know that we're seeing diminishing numbers in teacher graduation programs and teachers leaving the profession within the first five years. Uh, and I know all of us would like to see that change. And like John, we, we have not talked much inter between teams, but we have found that we're all coming up with similar ideas, which is how do we really just place um, value on our teachers, both new teachers and mentor teachers. So that, I mean, I think we all know, I don't think there is any teacher that goes into the profession for pay. Uh, and I don't necessarily think we, we stay for pay either. We love what we do in the classroom, but we also really want to be valued. Um, in new teachers, I think in the past it has been in the, the mentor relationship, uh, I won't read this outline to you. You can look that over um, when you have time and feel free to reach out if you want more information about our team's work. But what we really found is that it's really important that the mentor teacher is utilized 
most effectively to improve instruction and help support and encourage that new teacher. Some of our proposals were to have a more narrow focus of new teacher evaluation. Uh, the system has been greatly changed in the last six years, and it is such a big task to, over, to overcome. So one of our, our thoughts were if, if we had just simply one domain for new teachers, maybe two per year that they were really focusing on so that we could excel in one domain rather than being minimally effective in all the domains, because it's hard to achieve greatness in everything at the same time. Um, they might feel that they're then able to succeed and want to keep going in growth rather than feeling overwhelmed with all of that, that teaching is. Um, and also we found some states that, and I'll wrap up with this, that use their mentor teachers as more of an instructional coach. So rather than just simply meeting outside of school, they really uh, served as instructional coaches in the classroom doing observation and feedback. And in our research, we found that that was extremely rare for what is happening now in Michigan schools with mentorship. Um, so that may provide more encouragement to the new teacher, better growth, and a sense of value for teachers that are being honored for their skill and accomplishments in the profession, which really is something that, uh, like John said, unless we move up to principalship, uh, we don't always have those opportunities. So I would love it if you would take a look at, at this kind of summary, and if you have questions or want further feedback, please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Megan Balk, B-A-U-L-C-H, followed by Beverly Hogan. Megan, please correct. The Balch, okay. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, we're ready. Thank you for having me. I'm Megan Bolch. I'm the parent of an eight-year-old with Tourette's, ADHD, high-functioning autism. He also has vision deficits called extraopia, otherwise known as a lazy eye, um, and a hypothalamic dysfunction that requires him to drink water um, 50 to 70 ounces a day. So he's seen by multiple specialists. We moved a year ago from North Carolina to Michigan, and even establishing our medical care took quite some time to get into University of Michigan. But my husband was the principal at the incoming school, so we thought that we would be prepared. We transferred his paperwork in June. We held a meeting in August, two weeks before school started. We brought every evaluation we had. However, here in Michigan, the initial referral of a student with suspected special education eligibility includes a read meeting. Even though he already had a 504 and was highly successful in kindergarten and first grade, only receiving RTI services for reading and writing and small group instruction twice a day, um, they indicated that they would not be able to support his 504 and he needed to be evaluated for special ed. So with that team, um, if they suspect an eligibility warrants an evaluation, um, they can either do a new evaluation or use the existing evidence. They denied all of our existing evidence. The 13 eligibility categories, which I'm sure you all know, um, are often narrowed down at that meeting to obvious categories a student um, would not qualify for, but then the evaluation, if it's chosen to be completed, it's necessary to evaluate for all suspected categories. Unfortunately, across the state, um, the processes and rubrics that are utilized to determine if a student qualifies as AU, OHI, SED, or a learning disability are different in every single school, in every single county, all across the state. I have found only one county that actually looks at vision impairments other than a severe v VI category. I have found 16 OHI eligibility determination forms on different websites. I have found 19 different AU category eligibility um, processes. Unfortunately, because there's not a streamlined form process across the state, there's a loose interpretation of all of these eligibilities, the services these students can have. And instead of working with the parents, the team made a decision in three days by September 8th that my child didn't even deserve an evaluation at that time. They said because he'd been an RTI tier two in his previous school district and they didn't offer RTI at their school, um, that he was he was performing at grade level and on academic curriculum, so there was no need. We indicated that's why he had previously had a 504 rather than an IEP. Um, we've been through the whole process. We weathered an entire year. We did everything. Um, so yes, we've already done hearings and that type of thing. 
Unfortunately, I had to go back and decide after all of this, what was it that could have changed? And if there was one rubric that could not be loosely looked at, um, such as what the DPI in North Carolina does, and one process for every student, I don't think anyone would need to get lawyers and to try to work it out for it not working out for this student. So I'm just asking for um, a policy change to possibly um, look at having a standard form. And if any district wants to use a version of their form, they'd have to have it approved. They're so different. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Beverly Hogan. I represent um, Busy Mind Child Care Center. And I'm speaking in regards of um, great start quality, um, the rating. Um, basically, how they rate us is with so many stars. And the quality is that when you get a teacher to come to your um, facility to teach, um, she can stay there for a moment, but by the time you get rated for another quality rating, um, she's able to hop to another center. Therefore, your ratings will go down. And the way that they pay you by the rating is, you know, the quality of your school. So therefore, if a teacher <coughs> hopped to another facility, then our ratings go down, our pay go down. So it's really kind of unfair for the child care centers because if you still have your pay, you know, if you still have your kids that's coming to your facilities and your um, great star quality ratings is down, therefore your pay is um, decreased. And it's not really fair for us to begin starting with the four and then the next two years we go down by a two. So, you know, other providers, you know, we have discussed this several times that the rating is good, but it's just we can't keep the manpower there to help our quality of our school. And it's just really unfair for us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Candace Rogers, followed by Nina Hodge. Good afternoon, my name is Candice Rogers and I'm from Circle Time with Friends Learning Center in Redford Township. My concern is the wage increase. I've heard several people in passing speak upon a $15 wage increase. Owning a uh, small child care center, I feel personally that would be financial suicide for me. Um, in order for me to pay one teacher $15 an hour, I would have to use three students. The max I get for an infant is $5 an hour. So I have three infants to pay for one teacher. In that infant room, I can only have four infants. And I think that's unfair. We spoke earlier about educating the children. <coughs> we spoke about uh, preparing them for the future. I did my part. I went to school and I earned $15 an hour. I have the student loans to prove it. I just don't feel this fair to just throw $15 out and give everybody $15 and they don't earn it. This is a child care facility. I don't mind giving them to them if I have to, but child care has to be raised. We have to meet somewhere. We still have overhead. We still have insurances. We have rent. We have lights. That $15 an hour has to cover not only our payroll, but all of our other bills as well. And I just think nobody is taking all of these things in consideration when they're throwing this wage out there. Thank you. And this is Nina Hodge. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. My name is Nina Hodge. I have a business called Above and Beyond Learning Child Care Center, and I also have a GSRP program. Um, I want to um, set a background for me. I'm a single mother who raised my son. I have been on public assistance. I've worked for the big three at the same time. So I have compassion when the women come to me and when they need assistance. And at the same time, when I reach out to you, I want you to understand how compassion for us as well. So when Lisa brought to you in front, she has left, what's left? When she had the absentee hours that was included up to 260, 208 hours up to 360. The parents run out of those hours, so we want to ask her, when you made the increase, how do the, are the parents hopping from place to place? And when they hop from place to place, what happened to the, the center that they just left from? And also, how are you letting the providers know the hours? They're not sharing with us the hours. Registration fee is a good point that she made, too. What's included in the registration fee? 
What's the dollar amount? What are you looking at the demographic? Are you looking from an Oakland County range, from a Wayne County? So what are you giving us for the registration fee? Does the registration fee include the field trips? What does it include with the registration? So you can't throw it out there without giving us the information. She also said a landing page. What's a landing page? Who is it for? Is it for the parents? Is it for the providers? What's included in a landing page? So a landing page says, aha, it sounds good, but what is it? Did, did we get the explanation today? What was a landing page? The next thing she had on here is online health and safe training. Is it free? So am I providing this for the parents? Am I providing for the people from licensing at home? And so is it free for them that they have to have a health, health and safety training? Is, is it for the providers? Is it for, for the parents? So if it's at the home and in my facility, we're not allowed to smoke. So now I'm going to a home place that's not licensed, but can they smoke and drink? Is it safe and welfare for the children? So I don't have a problem that you can go home, you can get watched, but are we using our public dollars to allow them for them to be stay at home and they can smoke and drink? And when you come to my facility, we can't do that. You have to be 200 feet away in order to be able to have a cigarette. The next thing I want to share with you when she got to the key observation, it's very important because she has the gaps. We get paid 375. I'm a four star. So if I'm a four star, we got people in there with master degrees, bachelors, and CDAs in there. So I'm doing what I'm was need to do to get these quality there. I'm a long way from a five because I'm not perfect. So when she, I would like us to look into Ohio. When you get an opportunity, Ohio and other states, they get paid on a weekly basis. If I, they, the parent don't use up or they total nine hours. I'm always saying to them, you know, I'm getting short 375 an hour. Oh, you are? Yeah, I'm getting short. So would you like to make that difference? Because I just lost, I'm charging you a copay, now I have to charge you a 375 because I got cheated. When I know on a weekly basis, I can look forward towards the goal to paying my staff and everything. But when you don't come, I got short. The last thing I want to bring to your thing is what is quality improvement? So they have a guideline, what is the quality improvement? But even if I don't want to do the quality improvement, I just want to be an entrepreneur into this field, in this business. Do you think I should get a raise regardless of that? Milk is going up, food is going up, gas is going up, everything up. And for quality childcare, for these women, the entrepreneurs that came here, we have not have seen a raise unless we want to get into that five, the, the quality rating. So I just want us to think about in regards to women that's here to you today in front of you that have quality business. And we're just not getting quality, quality pay. So what happens? We get short in the quality to give to really our children. So I gave some of the flyers to some of the um, people that I spoke on the committee. So you can look me up in regards to where I serve, my demographic at the 4234, and how I'm marking out, just like DPS, he said here, that he have to reach out to get teachers, and so do I. And so I just need the raises, the money, the extra quarters to make sure that I can be able to pay my teachers as well, to give our infants, toddlers a chance to reach to the DPS where I went to high school at. I thank you. Thank you. That concludes public participation. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to the approval of the State Board of Education minutes. So moved. First approval is for the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of May 8, 2018. So May Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Discussion? Oh, wait. They were talking to me to keep me from conversing and recording. Did you fill out? They had me in there trying to look up the emails to try to resolve the, the first one without bringing it to the board. First one Are you Ms. Here? White? Yes. Oh, yes. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I go to lunch. I wasn't over there trying to do that. <laughs> I had an issue with GSRP. I've been had GSRP for five years. I no longer have it. Uh, the last meeting I came to, I spoke to Dr. K, and I got a piece of a check. I got an email saying they're going to prove me for the monies, and they haven't. It's been six weeks. I've missed three pay periods, and my staff. I'm doing like a wonderful life. Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? It's not fair. My kids did not have a complete transition because we had no funds. I had to make sure my staff was taken care of because they are adults and they have bills they have to pay. We're trying to resolve this now, and I don't know what the outcome is going to be. But I did speak to Mrs. Um, Doxy, 
and she did the best she could. I got a piece of a check, but they still owe me money. And it's beginning to get personal now because I got an email saying it was approved and I have no money. I got another payroll coming up on Friday. And they're not wanting to hear I'm going to give them a piece of money. So this board needs to make sure this doesn't happen again to another GSRP recipient. And it's, it's supposed to be about the kids, but evidently it's not. Because if it was, they would have had a heck of a going away. I had to put it together and put it in the yard. We went on no field trips, and I don't think it's fair. My 16 children, I'm doing summer school for them now to make up for what Wayne Risa did not do. And that's it. I don't need to take up no more of your time, but I need this to be handled. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Back to the approval of the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of May 8th. We had a motion. We had a second. Is there any discussion? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. The second approval is for the minutes of the State Board of Education Retreat of May 22nd, 2018. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the State Board of Education Retreat of May 22nd, 2018. So moved. Second. Sure. Discussion? <coughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Nay. So the motion carries. Then the final approval is for the minutes of the closed session of May 22nd, 2018. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the closed section session of May 22nd, 2018. So move. And second. Support. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Abstain. I, was, I, I missed the closed session. Okay. Yeah. And abstentions? Aye. All right. Motion carries. Our next <laughs> item is the report of the co-presidents. Uh, I'll just very briefly mention that I did get an email from NASB uh, that included their testimony to the Federal Commission on the School Safety, uh, which was presented by Robert Hull, the Executive Vice President of NASB. And I just want to point out that they did mention that there are uh, five states that have committed to working together in a state network to discuss successes, challenges, and innovations in social and emotional learning uh, to benefit the local needs, and Michigan was one of them. So uh, other than that, that's it. Okay. Good. Thank you, Cassandra. Dr. Z? I uh, had the privilege of uh, presenting at the Henry Ford to the higher education leaders who participated in the STEMI uh, conference and event over there. Uh, I shared the points of um, the um, top 10 and 10 goals and strategies that pertained or that were particularly addressed by the, the STEMI, that is the Science, technology, engineering, I forget what the M is, math, there we go. <laughs> um, invention and the, the, and now the E part is the IE, is um, inventions and um, entrepreneurial uh, work um, and uh, identified the points of our top 10 and 10 uh, goals and strategies that are addressed by STEMI education. Okay. Uh, and that was facilitated by Lucy Howell, who had presented to us uh, the previous month, I think. Uh, the other th item that I had is the Special Education Advisory Committee, SEAC, retreat is on Monday, September 17th at the Henry Center in Lansing. They're requesting a member of the state board speak at the retreat. I've done this in the past. Uh, it's possible I could do it again, but I don't know what my schedule is that day. If there's another board member that would like to attend and represent the board at SEAC's retreat on Monday, September 17th, they would like to know. They would like a commitment from somebody. Can you tell us a little bit about the organization? Well, it's the Special Education Advisory Committee, and it's made up of... Um, a number of appointees, I think 51% or I forget the percentage, but a majority have to be parents of um, special education students. Uh, and they uh, advise, assist the uh, MDE on their special education issues and policies and, and I think the um, application uh, as well. 
uh, when I, seven years ago when I was first on the board, I was on this, uh, I was the board's representative on this committee, and I think may have, I may have done it uh, once since then as well. Um, but it's basically to express our concern and interest in their work, uh, hear their reports, um, and um, I think that's I think that's it. So, if board members would like to check their calendars and let us know if they're available, we could revisit this at another time um, once you have a chance to look at your calendars. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. The next item is the report of the interim state superintendent. And what I thought I would do today is just highlight a few of the things that I've been involved with um, this past month. One of the things I've been doing is introducing myself to state legislators, getting a chance for them to get to know me and for me to get to know them. Um, I've represented MDE at a number of events this past month, including the Michigan Virtual 20th Anniversary event, the Michigan Teacher of the Year um, announcement in Pittsburgh, along with Michelle Fecto, the Michigan Children's Trust Fundraiser, and of course the Policy Conference on Mackinac Island. I've also been invited to be interviewed by the Detroit Public Television. Um, Christy McDonald specifically interviewed me. And I was interviewed for a podcast that was taped by the Michigan Association of School Boards, which will air later this month. I've been expanding my relationships with the governor's office, education organizations, and business leaders. I've had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the governor and his team, attended the Ed Alliance meeting, been in conversations with Middle Cities Education Association, and the Michigan Association of Superintendents and Administrators. I've met with representatives from the Business Leaders of Michigan and with the Education Trust President, John B. King, who is also a former U.S. Secretary of Education. This month and next month, I've, I've scheduled meet and greets um, for me to meet with members of MDE um, so that they get a chance to um, meet me, I get a chance to meet them, they get a chance to, uh, I get a chance to chat with them about my priorities and um, my goals that I had shared with the board at the retreat, and then for them to share with me the work that they do. And so we've scheduled hour-long sessions, I think there are six or seven of them over the next six weeks. And then at the end of this month, I'll be representing MDE and presenting at three professional organization conferences, the Middle Cities Education Association Summer Conference, the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals, their EdCon Conference, and then the Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators, their Summer Conference. And I would also be very happy to acknowledge any good news that the State Board of Education members would like to share with me. So. If you have good things that are happening in your life that you'd like to share with me, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> Let me use an example. And that is Lupe was awarded the 2018 Spirit of Frida Political Award. Um, this award was, award was bestowed on Lupe because she is an extraordinary woman who is doing great things for her community. So congratulations, Lupe. Thank you. Next item on our agenda um, is the report of the Michigan Teacher of the Year. Um, Luke Wilcox, our current Michigan Teacher of the Year, is not able to join us today. And Laura Chang, our incoming Michigan Teacher of the Year, also is not able to join us today. So we do not have a report on the Michigan Teacher of the Year today. Moving on to the next item um, on today's discussion action agenda is the discussion of the state superintendent search, and I am going to turn this over to our two co-presidents. Sorry, I'm skipping over it on the agenda here. Um, yeah, go ahead. So. Uh, we are going to begin the process of looking for a new state superintendent. And uh, I had um, indicated that I would try to put together a preliminary schedule that we can take a look at today. 
and so that's what I am passing out here. I based this on the schedule that had been passed out um, 2014, I believe, the last time we went through a superintendent search and um, put together the items that I knew that we would have to do. Uh, one of the things, the first questions that we have is about the funding for a, to go out for an RFP for a search committee. I don't know if we have any update on that. The most current update I have is that I have requested funding. I have been told that the, looks like the funding will be provided through the governor's office, um, but I don't have confirmation on that, along with um, some funding from the Department of Ed. Okay. Um, so that really was the kind of the first step is to identify if we have funding to do a national search through a search firm. And so once we have identified that, then we would go through the next steps. Uh, what we did in the past was um, we hired, uh, we reviewed the RFPs for the search firms, uh, identified, and again, everything we do with the search has to be done in a public meeting. So that's why I think some of the time it probably takes a little longer for us to do this work than we would anticipate, but because everything is such a public process, um, it has to be done that way. So uh, we would have to come up with uh, the criteria for the search firm that we want to use um, and any identify any potential search firms that we could pass along to the department that oversees this process uh, and any of that they have as well. And then we begin the process of looking at the job description and um, in the past, we had wanted to get public input on that as well. So that's one of the things that I put into this process uh, as well. Um, moving right into the process of how we identify candidates. Uh, any candidate can request to be confidential, and that will allow us to discuss them in a closed session in the beginning stages. Um, however, any candidate that does not request confidentiality, we will have to discuss in an open public meeting. Um, so this is to take a look at um, for discussion. If anyone has any feedback, um, it's kind of you know, this is it. Oh, questions? As far as the um, the firm, the search firm is concerned, uh, we have used well one when we uh, hired Brian. And that seemed to work for us. Why do we have to do a, a search for a firm? Is there many different ones, or how does that work? Um, well, generally, there's a purchasing process. Uh, I'm sure the state of Michigan has one. Any public institution has a purchasing process. So you can't just necessarily self-identify one institution that you want to hire. You have to go through the process of allowing multiple institutions the opportunity to apply for that that opportunity. So we would have to follow whatever the purchasing process is for the state of Michigan. Okay, so so then, uh, okay, so we go through that process. Do Does the purchasing department, they recommend somebody to us or we choose from that pool or how does that work? So we, so you would identify the criteria that we would use to create a request for proposal and we would send the request for proposal out and then based on the applications that we receive, we would review the applications to determine which ones meet the criteria that were in the request for proposal, and then we would share those with you. And then you would look at them to determine which, and have a conversation as to which firm you would like to hire. Okay. Um, so as I see the timing as far as new, potentially new board, well, I guess there will be at least one new board member, um, it looks like there's really no weeding out or re until after they're seated in January. Is that right? Uh, so, yeah. I, I so, I mean, we can do the preliminary, right, get right. everything coming in, but right. then as far as, I mean, that could be anybody, you know, the new people aren't going to be feel like they're excluded from anything no as far as and I think even in. if the elections in November if they wanted to come to the December meeting and be you know because everything's gonna be done oh, okay. in public anyway oh, so okay. they, they could certainly um, kind of sit in if you will on, right. on that process as well right. okay. if I may Dr. Z um, I felt uh, at the last process I felt that um, uh, 
we, although we did a national search, we only had one individual who was really a finalist, and, and most of the people we had were already in Michigan. I'm not sure that we need, I'm not sure that the new search needs to imitate, what I'm saying is the new search does, doesn't need to imitate the old, the previous one. Um, I think that we could probably cut some time off of the search as well. Uh, but those decisions have to be made by the board as a whole. I'm just saying that we're not, that, that the precedent from last time does not need to be uh, exactly what we do. Uh, Are you saying that, that we didn't get very many from outside the state, so we don't need to be as, as arduous at trying to get outside the state? Is that? Yes. Well, I think we had a lot of applicants from outside of the state, but we only had one finalist yes. from outside of the state. I wouldn't want to restrict our, uh, you know, our field. Well, I don't want to restrict it, but I think that one of the criteria has to be familiarity with Michigan's conditions, and most of those people are going to be active in Michigan. So I would not, I would, I would not rule out uh, candidates who want to apply elsewhere. But how much effort, how much money do we want to spend into into that? Do we really need to put ads in the paper in Florida or? Well, I guess we just do it uh, one or two of the nationwide um, uh, publications, and 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 that would still be appropriate. But yes, Lupe. But the the search firm is the one that's going to lead the the process. So they will tell us or recommend to us do a nationwide or this or the states or whatever. I think. That's in, you know, we have to, we're going to hire them. They're going to have to do their, a lot of work for us. So I think that's one of the things that they do. Well, and then in, but they'll ask us, what is our priority? Uh, where do we want them to put their efforts? Uh, and so experience, direct experience with Michigan schools is, we determine if that's high up on the priority or, or if that's lower down. Yeah, that makes sense because who better than people from Michigan to know the scope of the land? Uh, but Viti wasn't, well, he was originally from here, but he was somewhere else when they hired him. They hired a, they hit a home run with him. On, on the other hand, I remember the Detroit Education Authority, we got a guy from Kansas City. And uh, uh, I, I don't think that's. I don't know. I, I would take the direction of or the recommendations of the, the search firm. And when you look at the the timeline that Cassandra has graciously put together for us, you'll see in October it does say that the state board of education will finalize criteria, job description, and search process. Mm -hmm. So those are things we can start. You can start thinking about. Tom? Can you uh, explain as far as funding? So um, I would assume so. It has to come from the governor's office. No, it or? doesn't have to come for the gut from the governor's office. But when it does come from the governor's office, it saves money within the Department of Education. How much it, are we talking about? It could be somewhere in the fifty to sixty thousand dollar range. And how, it, how large is the MDE budget? I don't know, but okay. just last time we ha hired a search firm. The governor's office did pay for it. So I was asking right. if they would oh, repeat yeah, that generosity. That would be nice, but if, okay. Yes. I just wanted to make sure we weren't dependent on that generosity. <laughs> <laughs> say to the governor, it's your cabinet members. <laughs> oh. uh, no, let's not say let's that. Not go there. <laughs> um, but I thought it wouldn't hurt to ask if we could sure. continue that generosity. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yes, Lupe. So this is just a proposal. It might happen before July the 1st. So the July 1st I put there because uh, whoever we select will most likely already have a position somewhere and a contract. And most contracts require them to give a, an extended notice before they can leave. So I didn't want us to say, hey, we're going to select someone in March and they're going to start in April because that's unrealistic for most of the candidates we would have. Yeah. 
Most superintendents have contracts that begin July 1st and go through June 30th. Well, that would be a good reason then to keep the schedule as it is, as opposed to try to shorten it, as I suggested. Because, of course, you want to allow the, if it's a superintendent within Michigan, time for their Board of Education to start the process of searching for a superintendent. And then, of course, if it's someone within Michigan, um, and if that person chooses to retire, then there's the 30-day window in which they can't work for civil service. If they leave and retire from public education, then there's a 30-day window in which they can't work for public education or for the Department of Ed. So that's another factor to consider. It happened to us too. It happens to us too, teachers. May I ask the uh, in, yes. the uh, interim? It's interim, right? Yes, okay. it is. Super. Um, do we need to adopt this at least in a provisional way? Um, is that advisable at this meeting? We need to take some action. I guess I would turn to the board and ask if that is something that would be um, within your purview to want to do that. Is that a direction you would like to take? Well, um, well, you can make the motion, and then we, we discuss it. But uh, with the understanding that that it's a flexible, it, it, it's it's a flexible timeline. That we need to do this or do that. We can do it that way. Uh, then I would say yes. You know, we can at least we we are, are initiating something, a process. But with the understanding that it's flexible, then whatever happens, you know, we might have to change dates or. Would you like me to create? Sure. Oh, or would you could. I. Do you want or to make a motion? Cassandra, sure, make a motion. Uh, I move that we adopt the State Board of Education Superintendent of Public Instruction search timeline. Uh, with the understanding that the timeline may need to change or be altered in the future depending on, uh, you know, what we learn or what, what happens. Sure. Support. Support. Second. Support. We all Discussion? Second. <laughs> Discussion? I think we did it already. Okay. <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed say nay. <laughs> Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Item I on today's agenda is approval of Michigan School Counselor Professional Development Standards. These standards were developed pursuant to Michigan's compiled law 380.1233 to bridge potential gaps between the learning attained in an initial school counselor's education program and the learning acquired via professional development with an emphasis on college and career readiness, including military career options. These standards align with Michigan's top 10 and 10 strategic goals and with the Every Student Succeeds Act. The board is going to be asked to approve the standards at today's meeting, so there will be an action following the presentation. And our presenter is Krista Reed. Good afternoon, Krista, and welcome. Thank you. Um, so the last time I was able to be at the table with you, we presented you with the standards for the school counselor professional development. Um, they went out to public comment, and I think you've been provided all of that feedback, and we are here to look for your approval. So if you have questions, I think that's the, the main thing that we have for you, that I can go over the public comment um, feedback if you'd like. So we had a total of 295 survey responses, which is actually quite, quite impressive um, for our standards. And of those total respondents, 58% um, hold either 58% held the Michigan or hold the Michigan School Counselor license, and another 31% hold the school the teaching certificate with the school counselor endorsement. So a lot of feedback directly from those who are in the in the field working as school counselors. Um, and of the survey responses, 
received 27% of the respondents supported the standards fully or supported the standards with minor revisions. Nearly 12% of the respondents were neutral. And we have um, quite a lot of positive feedback within, within the comments. There were approximately 24% that stated significant revisions were needed and 37% that stated they were not in support of the standards. However, it's really important to note that of those, uh, those um, significant revisions and not in support, 100% of those were actually not on target with what the, su the survey was asking. They were responding specifically to the law requiring them to do professional development. And so uh, we had to set those aside um, and separate out the ones that were in favor of the standards and supported the standards. So if you have questions about that, I know that that can be somewhat confusing when you're looking at the, at the data. Questions have, of Krista or comments? Yeah. Huh? So first, um, when, they, when you mentioned that they are teachers or uh, held certificates, Mm -hmm. Is that self-reported, or do you verify that, or it's self-reported? Self-reported. Yeah. So, In the survey, one of the questions is how right. you know what your role is. Okay. Um, yeah, I you know I, I went through uh, a good number of them, and I mean there's a lot against. And you said that we throw we would throw out. I mean the concerns that you know how am I going to get these credits? You threw those out. Because they're not standards, they're implementation. Yeah, they're implementation. So, but that it seems to me, as we look at standards, the ability to, I mean, the the impact is something that is important to consider. Um, so, as I went through, there was substantial amount that uh, said that. Um, others say that it ties my hands, undermines work, doesn't apply to elementary school. So, why is it's kind of unfair or silly to or you know, um, problematic to require it for elementary school counselors, and I mean, I, just, I saw a lot of a pushback, um, and there were no adjustments or anything. This was, I don't know. I, I just found that there was a substantial amount. The of, standards are are established that show the things we want school counselors to know. So we met with the stakeholders, and they went through, and they said, this is important for our school counselor to know about career, about college, about military, because five hours have to be in military as well. The actual standards don't say how they're going to get them or how we're going to implement that within our current education-related professional development, which is how a certificate is renewed or recertified. Um, the law says that they have to have 50 hours. So the how we're going, how they're going to get them, goes back to the law, um, not so much the standards of what is good and what is quality and what is needed, and that's what the standards are supposed to address. Okay, so um, so they were going to have to. Okay, wait, the the fifty hours is current law. I mean, it has been law for a long time. Nope, it was just passed in November of two thousand seventeen. Okay. And so we've acted upon the law. The law, so the law requires that MDE establish standards for professional development, what type of knowledge or information needs to be obtained to meet the law. And the law says that they have to have 25 hours of career, 25 hours of counsel, uh, college admissions type of counseling, and of those, five hours have to be specific to military and military um, it was clear that even elementary counselors would have to. It was for everybody who has a school counselor license or credential in order to renew it from here on out going forward. Okay, Nikki. I'm you sorry, Tom, your question. Yeah, I'm for now. Right. Okay. Nikki? You said you went to school counselors and compiled them with them in mind or they, they help to guide it. Why is there such a kickback, you think? Where we're well, the stakeholder group was a small subsection of a large uh, cadre of school counselors throughout the state. So not every school counselor could attend that stakeholder group. Um, we did have a large number of, you know, in proportion to how many attendees were at the stakeholder group, we had a nice number of school counselors that took time to come in. Uh, we also worked with the School Counselor Association, which represents the, the voices of the school counselors. Um, 
and a, a variety of others. The law actually specifies who had to be a part of the stakeholder group, and it included admissions staff from universities, financial aid officers from universities. We had military staff there as well, business and industry. A nice group that came together to help us develop these. Yeah? Um, is there any distinction between what um, counselors at the elementary level could be pulled on as opposed to high school? I mean, it wouldn't be the same. Are there any recommendations <clears throat> that would be more age appropriate? For elementary, and is that incorporated Those, into the? The standards are not, you have to meet all of them in order to get your 50 hours. The standards could potentially be um, you could do standard 1.1 and 2.1 and offer a five hour program to elementary teachers that are specific to. There's a lot of different ways that you could implement the standards from a provider aspect or from an educator aspect and trying to obtain the hours that you need to best serve your students. So these are just the standards that then professional development can be developed based on. And the availability will depend on who wants to step up to the plate and offer training and offer professional development that can then meet these standards. And they can accumulate the hours any way that is best for them. And the standards are, are somewhat vague in that it could be a very elementary level learning opportunity or it could be something for high school graduates. Providing anything? No, we are not providing them. Again, is this something that they, that school counselors pay then to get? It depends. Um, we have lots of sketch. If you're familiar with state continuing education clock hours, that are free um, through our catalog. So if someone is a provider and wants to offer it through sketches, they could also potentially be offered locally. The cost of them is not is outside of MDEs. So this is just the standards, the standards for developing programs and however that plays out to whatever providers want to step up to the plate and offer it. We've developed just guidance for quality and what needs to be covered. These were the things that were valued by the stakeholder group to develop programs going forward that can be used. Okay, Eileen. Oh. Uh, we've been through these kinds of discussions before for standards development, and if there's one thing that um, bureaucracy does well, it's sustain itself, and I get that. And I also uh, completely understand that when change is necessary, that um, it's, it's complicated for people to adapt to the theory and easier for them to actually adapt to the reality, adapt to the reality. Um, what catches my eye is that the... Uh, and and I, I doubt that you have it, but you might. Um, of the people who actually hold the counselor license, what percentage of those people were opposed to this? Because you're saying that the opposition, 100% of the opposition, didn't say much about the standards. They talked about the environment that's forcing them to change, which is significant in my eyes because the stakeholder group that developed the, standard, or the standards was representative of people who are helping children learn and the people who are employing them and the general community. So that process to me was appropriate. Then you get to who opposed it and why. Mm -hmm. And if 100% of the people who opposed it were actually concerned about the fact that they had to do it, not how what they had to do, then I think we're on the right track. Um, do, uh, do you have the statistic of the council? We can get it. Um, well, I it's, don't only, have it. it's only background because it, in the end, I'm curious to see who is most unsettled by this, whether it's teachers who might want to become a counselor and now see that there's going to be more education that's required, whether it's counselors who are um, frustrated or frightened that they may have just gotten through school <laughs> and <laughs> suddenly they're being asked to change. The problem is that we need to move children through school well. <clears throat> and we need to make sure that they have a good chance of having the life that they're capable of getting. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me the process that was used to develop the standards took that into account. So for me on this, uh, I'm in favor of it, uh, but I also am very sympathetic to people who feel threatened by change because we're all going through that and it's complicated and it's not simple. 
Anyone else? Yeah, I, huh? I'm going to revisit. So your answer to Nikki on um, they have to pay for this is that some might, some might not. It, it's not in our purview, and I understand that. But um, is there, you know, it seemed like there was a large number that were concerned about how. I mean, is there potential that there won't be access to some? Um, that is um, that is a conversation we're having in OE. Um, we can't make people create courses. We right. can't. Um, the law says that they have to do the PD. So we'll do the most we can to, I guess, market it. Um, here's the standards. Do you have a you know have any ideas on how you could create a program? Universities could potentially jump on board and create a course, for example, that they could offer. But that that would be cost. something you'd have to pay for. Right. So there's a cost. Um, we have programs that are already being offered within our sketch catalog, so our state continuing education clock hour catalog of offerings. There are some that we feel might just need to be tweaked a bit to make sure that they're in alignment with the standards, and then they could continue offering them. That gives us hope that there's, there's some offerings that will be readily available. Um, our understanding is that there is an association that has developed kind of a packaged program that potentially already meets this. Um, we, we haven't gotten to the point of having providers apply for, for this yet, because we still don't have the standards approved. So once the standards are approved, we can take it out there and say, hey, this is what we have. Um, National Guard, would you like to do five hours of professional development that would help our educators meet this five-hour requirement that's in law? We can do some more marketing, but at this point, we're What's the timeline on this? How, when would they have to have taken those? 2020, so we have a couple years. Okay. We had to move pretty fast to get the standards approved. They had to be done by July 1 of this year, 2018. But once the standards are approved, we can work really hard to make it accessible, as, as accessible as we can, considering. And this, and this went through a committee last year and was signed into law last year? Yes, it was signed uh, do, into law. Was MDE supportive of the legislation or neutral or did you have I believe we were we neutral. Concerns? We were no neutral. Okay. Did we have uh, public concern about anything? We had concerns about accessibility. Um, we had concerns about obviously changing our, our programming. Um, we have an online certification system, the cost that could potentially um, mm -hmm. result so there is cost involved in us implementing this um, to change our system to accommodate the ability to make sure every school counselor who renews from here on out has these 50 hours specifically without having to touch 60,000 additional applications every year. That, that's one of the concerns. But. And then what would happen if we didn't? I mean, I don't see any problem. I don't see that we're not going to. But what would happen if we didn't approve them by July 1st? I think MDE would be out of compliance with the law, and I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> so I would have to defer to, to Sheila. And, yeah. If we don't want to be. I'm just, I'm just generally concerned with the process of things, knowing what it's like to have lots of requirements of certifications and professional development and knowing what that looks like to keep up and knowing that we have new teachers or we don't have a lot of new teachers. We have a teacher shortage. We have this big problem and even just having had public comment about how, um, how, do we, how do we get people to want to become a teacher then retain them when there's such an overwhelming amount of things. And I know this is just related to school counselor, but on the whole, it just seems like the process isn't, isn't really taking into consideration the greater issues that we have, number one, and number two, just the idea that that we don't know how this is going to be implemented, but we'll first start with a law, <laughs> and then we'll go for those standards, and then maybe we'll figure it all out over here. And it just, the process of that just doesn't seem very well thought out, um, and I don't know how you, I think that can play into maybe possible, you know, the sh teacher shortage conversation long term. Um, and even counselor shortage, however we end up breaking that down. But I don't know. I think there's a general um, concern I have with We've the lack of We've already thought about the processes. No, I'm sure. Yeah, but that, but we're like you doing said, the programming and so but forth. But you've admitted here now that we don't know how it will be implemented. 
That's right. a big issue. Uh, not to undermine your work. Yeah. Um, and I know that that, that that ends up falling on people like teachers, like counselors. And then it's kind of like, there's this law now, and here's these standards, so you figure it out. So we can only hope that we'll continue to have partners that didn't just sit at the table to set the standards, but step up to the plate and be a partner in those counselors that need those. Because it is it, it can be hard to get those um, professional development credits or continuing education, what it, you know, the continual issue of staying up to date. And I don't think that's a, I don't think that has to be confused with being afraid of being challenged or growing or adjusting. I think it's process oriented. So I would I would still say walking away from the table today, we need to work on that. Dr. Z? I was curious when, um, uh, what standing or, or what accreditation does a group need to have in order to offer um, the, uh, the hours, the professional hours? Um, at this point, our processes that we've documented thus far, and we haven't implemented any of them, but the, the process is identifying which standards are being met. Um, we have this is really the first of this nature of professional development that we've ever offered. The sketches that are currently in our system don't have standards aligned to them. So it is a larger conversation about quality implementation of professional development statewide that I know is going to eventually come up. But with this particular piece, they'll have to identify which standards that they're meeting. And they don't have to identify all of them. It may just be one or two standards and how many hours, and whether or not it's career, college, or military, or potentially all of the, all of the above. Okay, so a school counselor could say, yeah, yeah, I know about all these. I can lead a class and meet all these standards, and they just hang out a shingle, or do they need to register with MDE, or, or how does... To offer them as a sketch, they would need to apply and submit their application and get approved. Um, one of the things that we're looking at our system currently for professional development is doing, um, doing a better job. We have survey questions. When you complete sketches, you have to go into the system and, and respond to a survey, and it's about the the offering that you just completed. It's to get at quality, but I don't think we're, we're doing all that we can, especially with the higher stakes um, implications here. And so we're taking those questions and re reworking them so that they can provide us feedback. If you get the, I, I guess, and I, maybe I'm, I'm speaking too out of turn because we are still just having internal conversations about this, but the professional development that gets feedback that's continually poor should not continue to be offered. Okay. So that would be one way of kind of a market, marketing strategy that it, if you're not getting good feedback, you can't continue to offer the same poor program over and over again. I guess I'm, I'm concerned with the, this is a credential, and in order to get credentialed, you have to take the class. Now, do you, what credentials do you need to offer the class? Uh, and, of course, if you're breaking new ground, uh, then you have no credential. You are the expert. Uh, the entrepreneur is the expert in that in that sense. So how does? Uh, so I'm just curious as to how how uh, so an individual who feels he's got he or she's got expertise uh, to meet these standards would draw up a proposed class and then submit it to what the, that office of MDE is Cratch. Yes. Yep. Okay, and then they'd review the, they presumably have some criteria to review and then... To align to the standards. Align yeah. to the standards and then give the okay on the... On the All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, then may I please have a motion to approve the Michigan School Counselor Professional Development Standards. So moved. Support. Thank you. Any more discussion? Okay. The standards are what was, on, yeah, just one. The standards are, I mean, simply just these three pages, right? I mean, there's not uh, anything additional or no. more detailed than that. No, just those three pages. Okay, thank you. One last. Yes. So if we have issues with implementation, then who who do they go to to, have, to solve the problem of implementation of professional development? That would be our office. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Any more discussion? Okay. Seeing none, 
Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Hey, Krista, you're on deck again for the next <laughs> agenda item, which is approval of the standards for the preparation and practice of school psychologists. Yes. These standards cover the roles and competencies guiding the preparation practices of school psychologists. The standards support the top 10 and 10 strategic goal number three to develop, support, and sustain a high-quality, prepared, and collaborative education workforce. The board today will be asked to approve these standards. So, Krista, again, you have a presentation or information to share with us. I do. Thank you. So, slightly different than the last set of standards. The last ones were about uh, professional development to renew or recertify. These are the preparation standards for school psychologists. Um, these are more similar to the standards that you've approved for other educators uh, when they're getting prepared. And so there was a little different uh, feedback. And when we took it out to public comment, I believe we had 68 respondents. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 96 respondents. 68 supported the standards without any changes. 19 of those who weighed in supported the standards with minor revisions. Um, and of those two groups, they comp comprised 91% of all the respondents. Uh, there was really only one survey taker that was against the standards, while three were neutral, and five suggested significant re revisions, but um, they were after the, the comment period and weren't aggregated into the results. So the, the, essentially, the feedback was very positive, and um, we anticipated the positive feedback from the field. We were essentially moving the preparation standards from where they were in our administrative rules into a, an opportunity for you to approve instead of in the rules. So, Questions? I guess, yeah, I have a, you know, when, when I'm looking at this on, on page eight, there was a standard that talks about candidates to demonstrate knowledge of risk and prevent protective uh, Factors related to problems such as school dropout, truancy, bullying, youth suicide, school violence. If there are, this is just saying uh, demonstrate knowledge, not what that knowledge will be in particular. I mean, if there's, some people have different ways of, of dealing with an issue. Uh, maybe something's controversial. Um, it doesn't say this is how you're going to learn it. It just says that you're going to know about it. Is that right? It's the entry level knowledge, so yes. And my understanding is that's pretty common for the standards for right. prepar the preparation. Is that it's a demonstration of skills. Um, okay, I just know, for example, youth suicide. I've, I don't know. There's been controversy in the past where the, some people feel the more that it's being talked about, all of a sudden the more there's an increase in some areas. And so I don't know. I'm not going to say that's what I, right. I. But I haven't looked into it enough. But I just know there is a controversy there. I remember back 20, 15 years ago. This isn't saying this is what you will do, or this is the this, this is just saying that they'll know about right. maybe the various sides of the issues. Or anyone else? Yes, Nikki. The prep for the prep standards. What what are the major pieces of evidence that kind of are the foundation of those standards? Uh, the pieces of evidence that so that like is there a system or a um, thought process behind that? Um, there was a stakeholder group that developed them, worked with uh, the National Association, the Michigan Association of School Psychologists. They all came together, as well as the teacher prep or the educator prep institutions that are preparing school psychologists. They all worked together to establish these. Are they doing anything different from the Promise program that was happening in Florida, or is this something, you know, I, I know I'm really, I am relating the school psychologist to an important role player, I think, in, in that type of situation. So I'm just curious. There's, are they doing anything different from what they were doing, or are they doing the same things? Um, it, it, I'm not familiar with the Florida and the Promise program, but I do know that, that the standards parallel and look very similar to the national standards. They, they, it's not anything, um, I don't think Michigan has created anything completely unique that will support school psychologists in a different way than any other state, um, but they, they are in alignment. Uh, 
<clears throat> yes, Michelle. Um, what has changed from the way it's been done in the past? Um, they we've moved. They used to be in the administrative rules, and so the administrative rules we have a set for school administrators. We have a set for school teachers. We have a set for school counselors and a set for school psychologists. Those are administrative rule sets that govern how. Um, certificates and things are issued and renewed and the school psychologist administrative rules had all the standards embedded into the rules and they were the only rule set that had that um, moved them out of the administrative rules last November we took it out to public comment moved that but there's essentially the same rules there's no yep. change yeah tweaked it a little bit to make it them a little more up to date it's harder to change administrative rules and so it's easier for them to get out of date as things change and, and oh, so okay. forth. So having so them no longer, this way. They'll no longer be an administrative rule. Correct. They're now a, a state board approved item. Yes. Okay. Back to Tom. Sorry. Uh, so standards for the preparation and practice. So this says what they will do. I mean, can it, when it says, can, I don't quite understand mm -hmm. candidates and mm -hmm. the word will because mm -hmm. it sounds like uh, once they are not a candidate but a school psychologist, they they will do these things. Right. Okay. So one of the negative comments was we don't have enough school psychologists to do these things. Um, or if we've got one, they can't do the full scope of the standards that are there. And that, that wasn't actually the intent. We're not saying that they have to do this every day. <laughs> you have to go in and you have to do standard okay. one, two, three, four, all the way through. They're just, it's providing an opportunity so you can clearly see and outline what it is that we would expect from a practicing school psychologist. Now, if they don't do these things, if they are, can they be found in violation of standard 1.7? And if they don't no. clean up their act, they're <laughs> no, seriously, they're with no. you know, they're no longer a school psychologist. Right. If they prove incompetent at at you're you're expected to be able to do certain things, and right. if you're incompetent at that, then would this be referenced at that point? It's uh, no, I mean, no, I'm serious. Is this um, something that they could with? withdraw their certification if they yeah are, are shown to be incompetent or uh, not doing what is expected of them I, I my understanding of this the certificate or the school school psychologist certificate it is their property right there might be implications for their job and being able to retain a job I can't speak for what would happen at the local level if a school psychologist was in unable to perform the duties as described in these standards if the school would have any uh, any ability to um, but we no longer retain withdraw. their services, we wouldn't but withdraw. This, this would not be something that MDE could remove their certificate for, unless it was of legal action, which is a part of the school safety legislation and the laws that are that that we deal with when it comes okay. to criminal convictions and so forth. Okay, Michelle. I just had a case. You know, I represent the faculty at Wayne State, academic staff. And we had a case where a psychologist was a state complaint against, it was with Lara. And um, so there were rules, it was about breaking confidentiality. So she told somebody about a student, about seeing a student. Um, so I'm just wondering if those, if Lara is involved with those types of licenses, because she could have lost her license. She didn't, but she could have. So Lara licenses um, psychologists, like clinical psychologists. Okay, um, so that's just it's a clinical? separate from school, school psychologists. psychologists. Quite often they the hold world. both licenses, um, but this is the school count or the school psychologist certificate that we issue. Would be bound by the rules that Lara enforces. Right, that's separate. Anyone else? Okay. Seeing no other questions or comments, may I please have a motion to approve the standards for the preparation practice of school psychologists? So moved. Second? Support. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. And the last, sorry, the next item on today's agenda is state and federal legislative update. And that is... Marty Ackley, our Director of Public and Government, Governmental Affairs, will provide an update on the state and federal legislative issues. Good afternoon. Uh, we just heard that the state budgets are on their way to the governor now, that the legislature passed um, the budgets 
this afternoon, and they're on their way to the governor. Um, school funding um, increases. Um, $120 per pupil for the highest funded school districts and a $240 per pupil increase for the ones with the lowest funding. Uh, the increase would bring the lowest funding districts to 7,871 per pupil and the highest funded ones to 8,409, so they're closing that gap. On that, there's also more money for early on, um, which is early intervention system for uh, children with special needs. Um, there was language in the school aid budget uh, dealing with partnership districts. Um, the good news is that it includes partnership district concept into state law, which is what Brian wanted, Superintendent Wiston wanted. Um, they gave more in the definition, in the boilerplate, they added more clarity as to what should be in a partnership agreement and consequences if they don't meet measurable outcomes in the 18 and 36 month um, check-in times that was um, been, has been in the in the system from the get-go. And what it says is that the partnership agreement has to include measurable outcomes that will be achieved after 18 months, after 36 months to the date of the agreement was originally signed. Measurable academic outcomes under the sub sub subdivision must include outcomes that put pupils on track to meet or exceed grade level proficiency. Then it goes on to explain that if they don't meet them, that, then there's the option to either close the school or put into what Brian actually said, to reconstitution. And the language that is in the budget now gives a little more clarity as to what reconstitution means. And it says that the, um, that the district, and this is going to be amended to any partnership <coughs> agreement where this is not now, the, part, the partnership agreements have to be amended to include this language that the district shall make significant changes to the instructional and non-instructional programming of the school based on the needs identified through the comprehensive review of data. The district shall replace at least 25% of the faculty and staff of the school. The district shall replace the principal of the school unless the current principal has been in place for less than three years and the board of the district determines that it is in the best interest of the district to retain the current school leadership. The reconstitution plan for the school shall require the adoption of goals similar to the goals included in the partnership agreement with a limit of five years to achieve the goals. If the goals are not achieved within five years, the superintendent of public instruction shall either impose a second reconstitution plan on the school or close the school. So in a sense that this language, um, one, like I mentioned, it puts in state law the concept of partnership districts, which it wasn't before. And so that's a positive. And secondly, Brian had always talked about a consequence of, of reconstitution. To my knowledge, he never really articulated, he hadn't gotten to the point yet of articulating what reconstitution means, and the legislature basically put in law now what that means. So that's, that's now going to the governor for his signature. Um, other things, the school safety bills are still in the process, as are the, um, the Nasser bills. Those are still going through the process. The Marshall Plan um, and the, um, the Marshall Plan bills are expected to go through today also, um, which is $100 million um, to help the, um, close the, the skills gap. And the, the $100 million is to be given out in grants, most of it in grants, um, 29, almost $30 million to create and expand competency-based programs that results in competencies or credentials in high demand fields. Others include, there's a number here, but to highlight a couple of the big ones, uh, 18 and a half million to provide competent, competitive grants to purchase equipment to increase skilled workers and emerging, in emerging and high demand fields. And then more money to provide scholarships for low income students for a degree or credential in a high demand field to provide funding to post-secondary institutions and for coaches and mentors to provide incentive grants to districts um, and for Treasury for administering that program. So um, there is good news is that the, the Marshall Plan is, is, is going through, um, the Pathway Alliance bills are going through, the state budget is being passed, and all this before they go on break in a week, maybe, maybe this week. I had a, um, a couple of things. So going back to the um, partnership district language, uh -huh. Um, does it say who decides on 
when action takes place? Whose decision is that? And what it gets to decide on what action? It's it's in, it's going to be in the partnership agreement. Is the MDE who decides? The superintendent. Superintendent decides. Uh, let me read here. They can close uh, or or reconstitute. They need to decide whether they're on track. That's what I, yeah, I think that's the question is do they define, prof, you know, it says students are on track for proficiency. Is there a definition of what that means? No. It also okay. said something about academic progress. In outcomes, there. academic outcomes. Academic outcomes. Mm -hmm. academic. Um, but there's no definition of that either? No. And it's up to the superintendent to define that? Yes. Uh, to look on the so Dietrich, have, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at him nodding his head, so I didn't know. <laughs> so the only thing that it suggests is that they have to get up to grade level. You said it will be up to the state superintendent to define? To yes, define? To define what would be adequate progress. I, I would imagine there could be a lawsuit if somebody feels that that, def, that, that decision is bad. <laughs> well, the way the state I, superintendent is, but that would, but it sounds like it is going to be the state superintendent. To, the way I read it, which, uh, two or three years behind academic, academically. Um, one could argue, well, if they made 1.2 years of growth five years ago, they could completely close that gap at that rate. Um, others would probably say that that's not sufficient. It needs to be because they left it open <laughs> and like Dr. Vitti mentioned this morning, I think the have a goal of 3%, so that may not seem like a lot to some, yep. but for DPSCD, yep. to him that's significant. So that, you know, it, I guess it would vary like Dr. Martin said, like you say, I mean, it depends <laughs> on the district or it depends on the school. I also was wondering why they took out, do you have any idea or feeling about why they took out the options to have the ISD take it over or, or the CEO? I do not know that. Okay. No. Um, I, I do have a little oh, bit. Oh, you of, do? I do. I asked that question. Um, and the response that I received is that um, there was um, not much interest in ISDs, from ISDs in taking over schools and districts. However, in Oakland, when they stepped in and helped Pontiac, Pontiac. it was hugely successful. Right. So that that's kind of a shame that that's not... Right. An option. Um, I did have another question. Sorry. Um, you said that there was some more special ed funding. Could you give me more? Early on, the early on early program. Ed, I thought you said spe so. There's special ed early on. Right, early on is to help identify students with special needs at an early age so that they can start interventions earlier. Yep. Funds for that. Um, okay. And then. So I've also heard um, that there is some legislation, doesn't sound like it's going anywhere though, around the teacher evaluations um, to delay it or to help. Reduce the uh, impact, yeah, 20, it. bring it down to 25, that was or Republican led. Keep it, because uh, I think it's scheduled to go well, up. Oh, okay. 40%. I think, I think the move is to is Right, to yeah, this year it. it's gonna go up, yeah. I think, right. to 40, but right. there was some legislation yeah, I think it was Republican led. I was to have any chance? I, not this week. <laughs> right. Two, um, two initiatives that the governor did include in his proposal, one on um, reducing the, the, the funding for uh, cyber high schools and then also or for cyber schools and then also the share time um, cap um, were not adopted by the legislature. But there's no differentiated funding Correct. at all. Correct. 
My report. Yes, Michelle, you brought up a point earlier today when we talked about the early childhood funding around the, the Medicaid, uh, the, the work requirements for Medicaid. Have we looked at how that could impact um, programming here, particularly the, um, the child care? Um, I don't think we have, but I understand the point that, yeah, if Medicaid recipients are required to work X amount of hours, what impact that will have on the on child care? Yeah, there is an exception if you have a child um, under a certain age, but I don't think that six, applies to both parents. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if it does. Sometimes both parents need to so work. So I haven't looked at that mm -hmm. for the new, mm -hmm. for the revised. Are, are you familiar? I think there's an exception for if you have a child under six. It's six. Well, at least that was in one of the birds. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think right. that was Both the one parents, that was. You're yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Um, Lupe, do, is there a report um, on yeah. NASPY? Yes, I have Thank a you. report on NASPY. I uh, was at the state, I mean the state board. I was at their uh, board meeting last weekend, Thursday, Friday, no, Friday and Saturday, Friday and Saturday. And uh, uh, there's a lot of movement that's going to happen in Nashville. Uh I don't know if it's for the better, but it's going to be some changes. But we as, as a board, um, have to please uh, save the date for the uh, October the 17th through the 20th uh, annual conference, which will be held in, in Denver, and we will be celebrating 60 years of existence. So our organization is quite mature and experienced. There's going to be a lot of great speakers at that conference, and and as I said to you um, at, during lunch, we have good news for our state. So I hope that all of us can, uh, can attend this conference. Uh, so I, I love being in, in, on the NASPY board. I get to meet educators from all over the country and, and state board members. And, and, and they hear their problems and concerns and compare them to ours and how they're elected or selected or appointed. Uh, so I think we're in a unique situation how we are uh, or become part of the state board because we're elected statewide. Uh, and I, I, I strongly believe that we're the buffer between the, the people and in the government, and so uh, I hope it remains as such because we uh, we are the voice of the people, and, and in many cases they're appointed, so then their voice has to be to the uh, person that appointed them, and and so there's no voice for the people. Uh, so you know they're very interested in what we're doing, and of course I was interested in what they were doing, but it was a, it's it's a good group, very good group. Thank you so much. And uh, we will send out the dates on the um, NASPIC fall conference. We'll get the dates to the board members. Okay. Yes, 17th to the 20th. Of what month? October. 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 Mm -hmm. And where again is it? Denver. Denver. Great. Okay. Yeah. Eileen, um, do you have a report on the Education Commission of the States? Excellent. Thank you. Just a brief one. Uh, the commissioners are meeting in two weeks in Washington. and. Everything that's being discussed in Michigan is included on their agenda. It's unfortunate that they're having a lot of concurrent sessions because um, at any given point, I think in the first one, it's a choice of governance, early childhood education, um, 
Astri Learning. I mean, it's just action-packed. So they presented here, I think, in January, and there were a lot of questions about how they function. They're paid for by the states, um, and they research topics. They have a number of researchers who simply tackle when enough questions arise, any topic, and they pull together everything that's going on in Congress, everything that's going on in the states that has some bearing on our reality, and they're a tremendous resource. So I'm hopeful that uh, there will be some information coming back that will be, once again, of use to us. And you can go to their website if you've got questions on any topic that you're, you want a statewide compare, a, a countrywide state by state comparison. Thank you very much. All right, our next item, item 12, is the consent agenda. May I please have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I think there well, was a question. Wait, I would, I would, okay. Oh, you could either have the motion and we could just, I, I, we I don't need to pull it, but if I could just get that answered. So move. Let's make the. I, I think. I think we're not following uh, parliamentary process because we discuss before we make a motion, and I think we should make the motion, motion. Well, and then discuss. The question I was trying to ask is, do we have to remove it before we make the motion? And and Thomas said he doesn't need it to be removed. So you are correct. We could do the motion. I was trying to and figure then out under which discussion of first. the motion, you could just answer my question. Right. Yes, because we we discuss and then we make motion. And then you ask, is there discussion. any discussion? Of course not. We all, we just discussed. So, so may I please have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Support. And now for discussion. And how would you discuss it? Everybody can hear it. Where did I, I have it, it written down? Months, I think so. I had it. <laughs> it's just uh, D two. Uh, it mentioned programs and activities funded by this grant must include participation by eligible by eligible private school children and teachers. So I guess I just wanted to understand what that meant. Okay, I'm just going to read you the response that I got, all right? From? From uh, the Office of Educator Excellence. Okay. It is, the explanation I would give is the following. Section 2101-2104 of Title II Federal Regulations require that the state educational agency comply with Section 8501, which delineates specific guidelines for private school children and teacher eligibility programs such as the one that we are talking about today. So That's clear as mud, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a federal regulation, but it doesn't necessarily define. Teacher and leader instruction support grant. I guess I just want, I mean, does that mean that a private, any private school can just say, we want some money to, to educate our leader or our teacher? Yes. It does? Yes. As long as they come? Dr. Z. Okay. Thank you. You have to Yeah, I've run parochial schools okay. and uh, so, um, and especially in Taylor, they were, uh, where they had six uh, private uh, parochial schools of different denominations, uh, they um, made sure to, uh, when they would get a grant like this, the federal law requires you can't you know, it's a grant to students in the district, not to the district itself. Okay. So they apportion uh, off according to how many students you had. So they take all the students in the district, um, and then they, okay. whatever percentage my parochial school had, then that amount of the money would be allotted. Uh, and uh, sometimes they would set up a program for teacher education, and then our teachers could apply. Um, okay and uh, to the program on the same basis as other teachers. Okay, a federally funded. Yes. Okay. I've got and, a- and, and given through the MTE. Yes. Through the state. Okay, yeah. that's good enough. I've, good. I've accumulated nine college credits through such programs okay. personally. Okay, uh, I'm good. Otherwise, with drug education, they would just give us, you know, tell us what program you want to use this for and we'll give you the money for it. Thank you. So. We find the same thing true for Title I funds, too. They're allocated to, they're eligible to students who are attend private okay. if they apply for them. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. And the motion carried. Okay. Comments by State Board of Education members. Are there any board members who wish to offer comments at this time? Lupe and then Tom. 
Well, uh, today is, is a sad day in many different ways because today uh, was that um, mass slaughter at the Pulse nightclub in Florida where 49 people were killed and 53 were wounded. So as we reflect on that awful day, we must keep in mind all the different uh, mass shootings that have occurred after that event. And the number of incidents that occurred, they have occurred after that have been 716. Uh, number shot, 4,209. Number killed, 871. And number injured, 3,338. And then those are mass shootings. All shootings after Pulse, the number has, is 92,417. Uh, number killed, 30,991. Number injured, 61,426. And suicides, 44,000. So um, I will be uh, speaking at a candle vigil tonight uh, to commemorate this day. Uh, and, and so I am uh, asking all of us to keep in mind all the families that are suffering because of all these uh, people that were killed. And, and it's going to be a privilege for me to commemorate this day with many other Wendapidians and people from, from the area as we um, light our candles. Now, I belong to uh, the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, which is a statewide uh, group, and I will be representing them in this, um, in this event tonight. So it's... It's sad, and at the same time, it's a, it's a time for us to act in whatever form that we feel fit in our own personal situations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lupe, for that very important reminder. Tom? Yeah, I, uh, like everyone else, think I was very impressed by Dr. Vitti, and uh, I'm really, I would like to take him up on uh, visiting some schools. I hope that, I don't know if that's something Maryland or somebody can help coordinate. I, I hate taking up their time. Well, actually, we're at the end, so would that Are mean... No, we can't. Yeah, yeah but for, for September, Tom, we yeah. can. Yeah, I mean, do that, but also I wouldn't mind um, spending some time, I, with him. some time with him and maybe a few of his leaders during the summer, so, uh, and, then, and then set something up for September, October. I hate taking people out of their work, but for a few hours, I think. And it is, as I've said before, I think uh, these partnership agreements and this kind of a thing is one of the bigger jobs yeah. that we have, uh, and, you know. So I think that it's uh, real important that we do invest that time. So I, I'm very interested in spending a good amount of time, perhaps this summer, but certainly in the fall, um, visiting schools and really interacting. Mm -hmm. so if the board is interested, we'll set something up perhaps this summer to visit. Detroit and spend time with Dr. Vitti and his leadership team. Right. And then we can follow it up in the fall and do some school visits. Yeah, I would like and that. And will anyone who's available I'd like that. on the board, welcome to join us. So we'll make sure that happens. Good. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, yeah. Michelle? I yeah. wanted to follow up um, on one of the speakers, Megan um, Balsh, who came and spoke. Um, she brought up a number of issues, and she didn't get to speak on all of them. Um, one of the things that is of concern was with the seclusion and restraint uh, laws, um, something that had occurred was that um, the school brought up uh, in a hearing, um, there had been multiple uh, restraint and seclusion incidences. Where they had to ma physically manage her child. But not once was she reported. Was it her or her husband who was the principal? So, um, and it, and then that is a requirement. Uh, the requirement is to report and then have like a debriefing. 
And the point of that is so that you can identify what might have triggered that behavior and hopefully um, anticipate and be able to avoid whatever triggered the behavior. And that was never done. And my understanding is that in the law, there really is no enforcement mechanism. So if a school violates and doesn't report, there's no punishment. There's no, nothing happens to them. And a lot of these schools and districts have lawyers upon retainer um, that can, um, for very little cost, because they're on retainer, they can uh, dedicate, I think, something like $100,000 to a case, whereas a parent has, will have much more limited resources. And so, so the, the, I would like to see if there could be some dialogue. I know we've had, I was on, on the Lieutenant Governor's task force on this, and this was a big issue. It's, uh, it's um, I, Terry was really instrumental, Terry um, Chapman um, was, uh, Hopeful in understanding this, and I know that there's all sorts of constraints. Also, the fact that she brought up every school seems to have different criteria on what makes a special mm -hmm. ed student, and one of them is that the, in order to be considered POHI, um, uh, that you have to be performing at the bottom 10% in order to get services, and that's not at that's at some districts and other districts it's higher, but it's it's very. Um, inconsistent. So I would like to figure out a way to dig into this deeper and um, to find out if there's a way to improve the process for parents um, that's fair to parents and to schools. Because right now, from where I'm sitting, um, parents that are, a great, are at a great disadvantage if they come forward, depending on this district. I mean, some districts are really responsive and some districts see the parent who complains as some sort of an enemy. Um, so I, um, I'm not quite sure where to go with this. Um, and it would be great if we could have discussions about it without having it all be about lawsuits and hearings and people spending a lot of money on lawyers. Um, so I would suggest, at, at least as an initial um, uh, step, is to I've asked Megan if she would be available to come back and maybe meet with you and Terry or whoever you think would be appropriate, any, anybody, anybody from the board, to sort of get who wants to get more of a handle on this um, and to see if there's any policy recommendations or things that, you know, ideas that we could propose to, for improving this. So I would, um, it just seems um, hearing her entire story, or I don't know, she was limited on what she could tell me because because of the settlement agreement, I didn't get all the details, but from what I can tell, um, it was quite a brutal experience. We just moved with great hopes of doing great things in Michigan from North Carolina. I uh, put that out there, and I would like to follow up with you on that. If, what, what could be done? We will reach out to um, Terry Chapman okay. and share with her um, parents' concerns. And if you've indicated that MDE will contact um, Megan, the parent, then we will certainly do that. Yeah, I, I didn't, I told her I would, you know, I would want to have further meetings and I would perhaps we, that it could happen, but yeah, if you, um, I can, I'm happy to give you, I have her email, so if you wanted to do that or contact me and I'll reach her. Okay. Yeah. We'll do that. We'll follow up with that. Yes, Pam. I just wanted to say yesterday morning I had the opportunity of hearing um, David Hogg and Alfonso. I'm forgetting his lib, but anyway, they're from Parkland, um, Florida, and to uh, Lupe's um, uh, discussion that she had. Uh, very um, disheartening having to hear them retell their stories, but then their call to action, um, which I think Lupe hit on, 
But they did, I did speak with them, but if there is ever opportunity for them to talk about how we can do things locally here, I do know that uh, Governor Snyder is moving towards doing some work, but they they did say that they that they are coming to Michigan. So if we're mm-hmm. wanting to hear mm-hmm. about some of the legislative pushes, and one of the things that they did point out is if we can't get it done at, at a um, federal level, then then what can we do? at the local level, and so that was our call to action. Um, around the food allergy discussions, I know it's very difficult to focus. There's uh, there's so much heightened awareness around this, and, con- and, and parents do have legitimate concerns, and so, um, Kyle, I don't know if you can, like, talk about what you all do to help to, um, and not today, but um, what we can do to... <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. Uh, I, I don't know. It seems like we've had this conversation. I know I've been approached by someone from religious reasons. Uh, they were concerned about what were on menus for, for their children. So uh, just what are some of the things that, that we're doing to to help parents in those, those different ways? And then around the uh, child care, there were some um, concerns that were brought up there that I think, you know, we know that our you know that the that the um, keeping um, um, workers there at child care facilities is is a big uh, problem um, and and it can change the whole dynamics from day to day just like we we've had these discussions around the k through through twelve so um, you know if there's any insight that you can give to to us on that that would be great uh, as well. We will put um, responses to both of those in board briefs. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone else? Let me just ask on Michelle's uh, issue on the enforcement. If they don't, if schools don't inform the parents, we wouldn't be able to do anything. It would have to be a statutory change, wouldn't it? You would think uh, we couldn't. Right. We couldn't. Say, we can only talk about policy, not right. not enforcement. So I mean. Right. I think at the very least, it's not much, but a, a resolution from the board um, would be appropriate at the next meeting. And I, I mean, I think it seems like it would be an issue that we could get some um, interest in on both sides. Right, I think so. We'll, we will look into both of those. Okay. All right. Moving on to future meeting dates. We do not have a State Board of Education meeting in scheduled for July. <laughs> Our next one is Tuesday, August 14th, 2018, 9.30. It's a regular meeting, followed by Tuesday, September 11th, 2018, at 9.30, a regular meeting. And then Tuesday, October 9th, um, 2018, at 9.30, we have a regular meeting. If there are any specific items that the board members would like us to include in future meeting agendas, please reach out and let us know. We would be very happy to accommodate those. And we will be working in the next few weeks to finalize the agenda for our August meeting. The State Board of Education will be taking a recess in July. So we hope that you enjoy um, summertime in Michigan. And to our viewing audience, we hope you also have an opportunity to enjoy summer in Michigan. So with that, we are adjourned. Um,